Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we will be continuing our discussion of valvular heart diseases and we'll continue with the discussion of mitral valve stenosis. In this video, we will talk about the causes, the history and presentation, the examination findings, the treatment options, and an exam question related to mitral valve stenosis. Let's start our discussion of mitral valve stenosis. What is mitral valve stenosis? Mitral valve stenosis is basically the narrowing of the mitral valve. So if you look at this picture, this is the normal mitral valve. You can see that there is quite a diameter of the valve. And then if you look at this picture, you will see that the mitral valve has stenosed or has become narrow. The normal diameter of the mitral valve is about four to six centimeters square. But when it becomes less than 1.5, that is when there is severe mitral stenosis. If this valve is stenosed due to any reason, what's going to happen is that there is going to be impedance in the flow from the left atrium into the left ventricle and consequently into the rest of the body. It is also going to result in the backflow of blood into the lungs. In return, what's going to happen is that there's going to be pulmonary vascular resistance and consequently congestive heart failure. Some factors that worsen the mitral stenosis is atrial fibrillation. Because of increased backflow, the atria is going to stretch. And with stretched atria, there is more chances of atrial fibrillation, which is going to worsen mitral stenosis. Another thing that can worsen mitral stenosis is pregnancy. Because in pregnancy, what happens is that there is increased blood because of which there is increased preload. And if there is more blood coming into the atria, but the atria cannot propel blood forward, it's going to worsen the situation. Another thing that can worsen the situation is tachycardia. With tachycardia, your heart is beating fast. But because of stenotic mitral valve, your heart cannot pump blood faster. And that is going to worsen the situation. Now let's talk about the causes of mitral stenosis. The most common etiology of mitral stenosis is rheumatic fever. In rheumatic fever, what happens is that if left untreated, your body is going to develop antibodies against the streptococcus pyogenes that causes rheumatic fever. Instead of the antibodies attacking the bacteria, they're going to attack the valve. It is going to result in stenosis 20 years later. In the tropical areas, however, it might happen fast. You might have a patient that is aged 20 to 30. This is uncommon in the US, but it is common in the third world countries. So in your question vignettes, you might get a question that has an immigrant or refugee or maybe a pregnant woman because we know that with pregnancy, the condition might become worse. Now let's move on to the symptoms of mitral stenosis. Some of the symptoms are dyspnea, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and hemoptysis. The reasons for dyspnea, orthopnea, and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea is that because of left atrial hypertrophy, blood is going to go back into the lungs and that is going to cause difficulty in breathing, difficulty in breathing with exercise, and difficulty in breathing while sleeping at night. Another thing that's going to happen is decreased exercise tolerance. The person is going to become very breathless very fast while exerting. Hemoptysis, however, is a rare finding and it happens in the very severe form of mitral stenosis, but it is a finding. And the reason behind that is due to back pressure into the lungs, the capillary in the lungs can rupture. When the capillaries in the lung rupture, it's going to cause pink frothy sputum to come out. With severe mitral stenosis, you might also find blue facies. The reason behind that is because of increased back pressure to the lungs, the lungs are unable to oxygenate the blood that it gets, because of which your face can look blue. When I say your face, just bear in mind that I'm talking about patient and not you, so don't take it personally. <laughs> Anyways, unique features secondary to left atrial enlargement includes atrial fibrillation. When the atria stretches because of left atrial hypertrophy, it is going to result in atrial fibrillation. Dysphagia can also result because the heart becomes enlarged enough to put pressure on the esophagus and that can result in dysphagia. Hoarseness can also happen as a result of enlarged heart putting pressure on the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Thrombosis can also happen which can result in cerebrovascular accident and in turn stroke. There can also be pneumonia because the left atrium enlargement results in left main bronchus occlusion and that in return causes pneumonia. To conclude, the main symptoms that you need to remember is dyspnea, orthopnea, PND, hemoptysis, atrial fibrillation, dysphagia, hoarseness, pinched blue facies, peripheral edema, and pneumonia.
It's not necessary that examiner will give you all of these symptoms, but they can give you any combination of these symptoms. Now let's move on to the physical examination. There are a few things that you need to remember when it comes to mitral stenosis. The first thing you need to remember that the S1 will be loud. Now what is S1? S1 is the sound that is produced as a result of closure of the mitral and tricuspid valve. After the closure of mitral and tricuspid valve, the systole will ensue. The S1 will be loud because at the beginning of the systole, the stenosed valve will close with more pressure, resulting in a loud S1. After this, systole will happen as normal. After systole, we know that the aortic and the pulmonary valve is going to close, which is going to result in a sound called S2. As we know that S2 has two components, an A2 component and a P2 component. The P2 component is going to be increased in volume as well. The reason behind this is due to back pressure which results in right ventricular hypertrophy and that will result in an increased P2 sound. After the closure of aortic and pulmonary valve, there is going to be an opening snap. The opening snap is basically the mitral valve opening with a snap. Now if you remember, the opening of the valves do not produce any sound but because this valve is stenotic, it will snap open during diastole. Now the closer this opening snap is to the S2, the worse is the mitral stenosis. After the opening snap, there is going to be the diastole. During the diastole, we will hear a mid-diastolic rumble. This mid-diastolic rumble will be heard best in the left decubitus position at the apex. And you can hear it best with the bell of the stethoscope. And the cycle will repeat itself again and again and again. So, to sum it all up, we'll have an S1 and S2, between which is going to be the systole, which is going to happen as normal. But the S1 is going to be loud. Between the S2 and S1, we're going to have an opening snap. The closer the opening snap to the S2, the worse the mitral stenosis. Between the opening snap and the S1, again, we're going to have a mid-diastolic rumbling sound, which can be best heard in the lateral decubitus position with the bell of the stethoscope. Now, I hope you remember these things. So, let's also read it from the first aid step to CK book. There's going to be an opening snap and a mid-diastolic murmur at the apex. There's going to be pulmonary edema because of backflow of blood into the lungs. And if we do echocardiography, we can see transmitral flow velocity, which is going to be increased. With echo, you can look at the valve, you can look at how much it is stenosed, you can look at the uh, amount of blood flowing and its velocity as well. The transmitral flow velocity will be increased because if you narrow the jet of a pipe, you will see that the jet increases in its velocity. Same is the case with this. The narrower the valve, the more the velocity of the blood jet. One more thing I need you guys to remember is that anything that makes the heart bigger is going to enhance the murmur. For example, with exhalation, the heart will become bigger and that is going to increase the murmur. And anything that makes the heart smaller is going to depress the murmur. So if you do Valsalva maneuver, you will not be able to hear the murmur as accurately. Now, some EKG or ECG findings are as follows. You will find in the ECG signs of right ventricular hypertrophy, left atrial hypertrophy, and atrial fibrillation. To see right ventricular hypertrophy, you will have to look at leads V1, V2, and V3. You will find large QRS complexes. For the signs of left atrial hypertrophy, you will have to look at leads V1 and V2. You will find that there is a large up and down component of the P wave, and if it is more than one square box up, and more than one square box down, this is called large left atrial size or left atrial hypertrophy. You might also find signs of atrial fibrillation in which basically there will be no P waves, but it is not specific to mitral stenosis. You can also do a chest X-ray in which you will find a double bubble sign, pulmonary edema and pulmonary cephalization. Let's look at that in this x-ray. Now, if you look at this, you will find that because of the left atrial enlargement, there are two shadows. This is known as the double bubble sign. There will be pulmonary cephalization, which basically means that the pulmonary vasculature will be engorged. Or you can also find signs of pulmonary edema. Now let's move on to the treatment of mitral stenosis. First of all, you will start with loop diuretics or Lasix, which is going to relieve your lungs of the extra fluid. We know that because of back pressure, we have a lot of fluid in the lungs and we want to get rid of that fluid so that the symptoms of dyspnea, orthopnea, PND and hemoptysis can be relieved. 
So first of all, we will give the person loop diuretics. Another thing you want to relieve is the atrial fibrillation signs and symptoms. We know that with the stretch of atria, there's atrial fibrillation, which can be a dangerous sign. We want to get rid of atrial fibrillation for which we will give antiarrhythmics, including beta blockers, digoxin, or calcium channel blockers. Along with that, we'll also give warfarin. Warfarin is going to prevent clot formation and clot dislodgement. The surgical options include mitral balloon valvotomy. This is effective when the stenosed valve does not have any calcification. If there is stenosis on top of regurgitation, we will do valve replacements. For valve replacement, we can use bioprosthetic valve or mechanical valve, for which you will need anticoagulation therapy. This is surely effective for very severe cases, but we have to look out for the INR, which must be between 2.5 to 3.5. Lastly, I want to discuss this graph with you because this might come up in your exam. The left atrial pressure, like you can see, is very high. In fact, higher than the left ventricular pressure during the diastolic phase. The left atrial pressure should not be exceeding 4 to 12. So it should be around here. It should stay around here. But because of mitral stenosis, this left atrial pressure is exceeding even the pressure of the left ventricle during diastole. So if you get a graph between the left atrium and the left ventricle, and the pressure of the left atria during diastole is more than that of the left ventricle, know that this graph is representing mitral stenosis. Now that we have discussed mitral valve stenosis, I want to discuss a question with you guys. So the question goes something like this. A 37-year-old woman comes to the emergency department due to left-sided weakness that started several hours ago. She has had no fever, headache, or vision changes. Over the past six months, the patient has had progressive exertional dyspnea, nocturnal cough, and occasional hemoptysis. Okay, first of all, I want to discuss the age with you guys. So the age of the patient is 37. We mentioned that if a patient has had rheumatic fever in the past, they can present 20 years later in their 20s or 30s with mitral stenosis. Now this patient doesn't have any other symptoms except that since the past six months, she is experiencing progressive exertional dyspnea. So decreased exercise tolerance, nocturnal cough. So when she lays flat, that's when she has her symptoms and occasional hemoptysis. Hemoptysis is a severe sign of mitral stenosis. She also had frequent episodes of palpitations and irregular heartbeat. Okay, so that can also be signed because of stretching of the left atrium. The patient immigrated from Cambodia. So she is an immigrant. Remember, I told you guys that in the vignette, you might get a question about an immigrant because rheumatic fever is common in third world countries and not common in first world countries. Cambodia is a third world country. She has never used tobacco and does not use alcohol. On urological examination, left-sided hemiparesis is present. That could be because of complication of mitral stenosis and decreased blood flow to the brain, which might have resulted in left-sided hemiparesis. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? So aortic insufficiency, why don't we consider this option? So this option can be likely. Why? Because rheumatic heart disease affects mitral valve and aortic valve as well. But more common is the mitral valve. And these symptoms are more consistent with mitral valve stenosis than aortic insufficiency. So we will cross that out. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is basically when the septum between the ventricles is enlarged. And it will have similar symptoms like dyspnea and all of that. But hemoptysis and palpitations and irregular heartbeat are not expected with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Then we have pulmonary arterial hypertension. If we think about it, progressive exertional dyspnea, nocturnal cough, occasional hemoptysis might be there. But left-sided hemiparesis along with palpitations and irregular heartbeat are very uncommon. The last thing we have is Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. So Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome happens because there is an accessory pathway which results in a which results in uh, supraventricular tachycardia and that can result in palpitations and irregular heartbeat. But hemoptysis and exertional dyspnea, nocturnal cough and left-sided hemiparesis is uncommon. So 
At the end, we will choose mitral stenosis because mitral stenosis is most consistent with the patient's symptomatology. That ends the discussion of mitral stenosis. I will see you in another video with maybe mitral regurgitation and we will continue our discussion of valvular heart diseases. I hope you enjoyed this video and had something to learn from it as well. If you did, please share it with the rest of your fellow medical students and I hope to see you next time. Till then, take care of yourself. Bye-bye. Thank you.